Coming up on Mississippi Roads, we visit the Artifact Shack and the French Cemetery in Biloxi. We dig for fossils and find out the truth behind the old Capitol mummy. It's coming up now on Mississippi Roads. Down Mississippi Roads. Mississippi Roads. Hi, welcome to Mississippi Roads. I'm Walt Grayson. We're at the Winterville Indian Mound Complex, north of Greenville on Highway 1 up in the Delta. And the reason we're here is the entire show, we're going to be taking a look at archaeological sites and artifacts found in Mississippi. Let me tell you a little bit about this place. It was built about 1000 A.D. and was in use through about 1450 A.D. It was a ceremonial center. The priests lived here. Back behind me, they would have had a temple on top of this tall mound. And you could have found sites like this pretty much all over the eastern United States. Now, something special about this place is the tall mound at 55 feet tall. This is one of the 10 tallest Indian mounds in the nation. And it was made by hand. You know, pretty much everything that we know about the people who built this site, we know through archaeology studying their artifacts, which leads us into our first story. We visit with an artifact collector who has literally dug up history in his backyard. Archaeology is important to history. The artifact shack was put together with the thought of teaching others, especially younger folks, because there's a lot of misconception, there's a lot of misinformation about prehistory Mississippi. We have some treasures right here, and our citizens are missing out. I wanted it help to show others that Mississippi is fossil rich. Jeff's Artifact Shack, uh, as he calls his museum there in Silverina, Mississippi, I think is the only uh, museum of that sort in any part of that area of Mississippi. Uh, there, there may be other museums, smaller museums, but they all get funding. The special thing about the Artifact Shack is it's a passion, a personal passion of Jeff's, and he gets no funding. I don't even think there's a tip jar in there. <laughs> The shack was put together to educate. It was also put together for me to share the, the simple stories of finding some of the things because they're, it's, it's a personal thing. This is not a state-sponsored museum. This is one person. I, I'm not sponsored by 15 corporations. I don't have elaborate heating and ventilation system. I got a little small room, but with some neat things in it. And each one comes with a story. I first met Jeff McCraw in January of 2008. He'd come in with his nephew and boxes of bones that he found along the Chickasahay River. Now, people walk in with fossils uh, all the time, but Jeff had a very unusual set of fossils that all belonged to one animal. Uh, and the boxes of bones that he brought in that January of 08 contained quite a treasure. Uh, and they turned out to be the bones of a four-legged whale. Finding the whale bones on the Chickasahay, that really propelled the, the passion for, for looking for things um, because uh, I found out that that find was, was really um, a neat find for science, a neat find for paleontology, not only for Mississippi, but for the, for the country. Because for a while, they thought it might have been a first species of that particular whale found, although it, it turned out it wasn't. But it was the first four-legged whale found in Mississippi, and I'm very proud of that. The fossil whale that Jeff had discovered, uh, the bones are now deposited here with the museum. Jeff recognized their importance, and so he donated them to the museum. And uh, Jeff has been donating to the museum ever since, and he's donated quite a few special things, helping us document Mississippi's fossil diversity. There's nothing quite like discovering an artifact. But when you look down and find a cool fossil or a cool arrowhead or an artifact or something, it's like a natural high that it's, it's hard to compare to. It's, it's, uh, 
It's just a great feeling to find something very rare and very so neat and very cool. So this is kind of a cool find, don't you think? Um, Jeff's artifact shack there in Silverina is quite a service to the community. Uh, the Museum of Natural Science here in Jackson serves the whole state, but we can't be everywhere all the time. And a little local museum like Jeff's museum can really say a lot about uh, the area's uh, prehistory, uh, its deep history, like the fossils. Uh, Jeff has a variety of artifacts, historical and prehistoric, as well as a diversity of fossils found within just a few miles of the little museum itself. So he can tell the public a lot about what's in their backyard. And people really relate to that, and they appreciate it. More people are going to listen to someone that's where they're from. It's just something about having someone that knows the area around you kind of makes people want to learn more. I love archaeology and anything to do with paleontology, but most people around here don't know much about it, so having this really helps. The early settlers to block up their houses. The artifact shack is important to have because it's a great educational tool um, due to the fact we do geography all the time in schools and then we're learning about science, we're learning about the animals and now you get to know how Mississippi is tied in with all of that, especially Smith County. All of this area right here at one time was under a shallow sea. Um, learning that we had palm trees at one point, we were covered in salt water. You cannot beat that knowing about your own town. Yeah, palm trees did grow right here in Smith County at one time because the proof is in the fossils. Sea rocks can talk. <laughs> well, that's more of the whale remains that were at this location. I've learned a lot by finding things. Uh, I've enjoyed the hobby so much of, of going out, being in nature, being uh, on a very scenic river, and then finding something that a man made 7,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, or a fossil that was 25, 35, 45 million years ago living in Mississippi makes you have a little different perspective on things. Rocks have a story. It's in a different language. You have to learn to read that language. You have to understand that language. It takes a little time, but if you observe stones, observe fossils, sooner or later you're gonna understand that story. Well, there's only about a dozen mounds left here at the Wernable site. There used to be as many as 23. A lot of them on the perimeter especially were lost over time due to agriculture. But what's here now is protected by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And you don't have to go to remote places to find archeological sites. Here's one that's also protected that's just up from the water at Biloxi. The Moran site has been a fixture on the Gulf Coast for years. As a little girl, you heard of the skeleton under the plexiglass, and uh, not only, you know, the Morans renowned for their, their art, but everyone liked to come and see what, what was lying underneath the house. The site was first found at the time of Camille in 1969. When they were doing some repairs to the foundations of the Moran Art Studio, they found some human remains at that point. My grandfather uh, put in a, a glass floor for people from the community and, and around the, the, the state to come in and, and actually view the remains. People would line up all the way out the door to come in and, and see just a glimpse of what we had uncovered underneath the building. One of our graduate students talked with the Moran family and they agreed to let us to go under the house. And so we looked at the remains that, that had been found back in 1969. 
And so we finished up that project in early 2004 and pretty much assumed that that was going to be the last of our contact with them. And then, of course, Katrina came along about a year and a half later. When Katrina hit in 2005, it decimated the area and the studio was, um, was gone and it uncovered more remains. So in 2012, through a grant program, the Department of Marine Resources purchased the Moran site and completed a full excavation with USM, University of Southern Mississippi, Dr. Danforth. And that's where, through the biological research, was determined that they were French. We initially recovered the remains that were on the surface, and that actually took a lot longer than you might anticipate because we were also dealing with all the debris that was from the house. We essentially had to move the sand until we found evidence of human remains emerging on, on the area that was, was exposed at that point. We brought them to the, uh, the lab and uh, we tried to, to treat them with utmost respect, remembering that they were once living individuals who, who had families and were you know, members of the community that loved them. So we try to give them the respect that is due individuals, uh, all human beings in that regard. Uh, we photographed them very extensively. We did complete inventories. We looked for pathologies. And uh, we, we essentially tried to do all of the analyses that are possible today, working with, with human remains to, to reconstruct the lives of these individuals. The people who came to Biloxi at this time were brought over from France and a few of them actually from places like Bohemia and, and other parts of Europe. The main thing was they had to be Catholic. But what happened was the crown was essentially out of money after fighting too many wars and they didn't have enough money to invest in, in developing the Louisiana colony. So they sold the job, shall we say, to a, a, a a private entity. His name was John Law, and he was uh, a Scotsman, and he was trying to bring Europeans over at the time. Out of the 32 individuals that we had, only two were females, and most of them were young adult males, and that makes sense because a lot of the, the, the individuals brought over were uh, convicts, they were also soldiers, and so it would be a primarily male um, bias in terms of, of those jobs. We were able to look at a number of health markers on these individuals, and one of the things that we found was that they were relatively short. The males were about five foot four, and the females were about four foot ten. And this reflects that, that when they were growing up, they probably had a, a, a lot of nutritional deficiencies, and especially of protein, and that would fit the fact that most of the people who were brought over were from the lower echelons of society, to put it nicely. It just didn't seem right to keep them in a, you know, university locker that they deserve to be um, put back where they were found and, and in their resting place. So we had the, the feathers, the pomp and circumstance, uh, everything that would make a Frenchman proud, and we reburied them in a full Catholic mass. What people see now when they visit the site is because they were French settlers, we wanted to look at a small area of, uh, of the Versailles Gardens, very French inspired uh, box hedges with these beautiful roses and, and hollies and putting the angel in a weeping form. She just stands there with her hands in her face reflecting on what it took for us to get to this point in our, in our culture today. It really is a fitting memorial to those that were laid to rest here. Uh, and it's, it's a fitting tribute to them. It's a beautiful site. Um, it's got a magnificent view. Um, and it's, it's just a fitting tribute. Here at the Winterville Mounds, there's also a museum where they have on display some of the stone tools and some of the pottery that's been found on site. But you know, not everything we dig up is related to humans. There are a lot of fossils in Mississippi too. So let's follow a fossil hunter and go to a popular and accessible site and dig up some more of our past.
So in the northeast corner of Mississippi, there is a place called W.M. Browning Cretaceous Fossil Park. It's right off of Highway 45. All you have to do is just dig in the sand here, and then you sift that, you're gonna find some fossil shark teeth. This whole area was covered in a warm, shallow ocean back 75 million years ago. Because of that, there are lots of marine fossils, everything from oysters to shark teeth, ray teeth. These are very common fossils to find at W.M. Browning, and they are from the goblin shark. This is from the lower jaw, and this is from the upper jaw. This is fun, fun to come here with the family. Find an oyster shell in Northeast Mississippi. Is that not a strange offering? And it's free. Beautiful Mississippi. I am a teacher, science nerd, and I like to dig in the dirt and uh, find things. I think I got started because my dad was my scoutmaster back in the 70s, and he planned a lot of neat things for us. We went and we explored fields that had been plowed, and we found Indian relics. And then I went with my father to Oklahoma. And it was uh, actually near a concrete plant, and we found trilobites, which are like underwater cockroaches, and discovered fossil shark teeth, uh, stingray teeth, and the like back in the day. And I think once a parent puts this flame inside of a child and gives them the context to express it, then uh, sometimes it just keeps rolling. <laughs> Yeah. Whoa, <laughs> I just stepped in a hole. Okay, this looks like the right kind of gravel here. Once you descend and get ready to fossil collect, it's important to dig in sand because that's where the gravel will be. And especially when you hit that crunchiness at about one to two feet down. So make sure you stay in a sandy area, especially where you can dig under a log or, some, or kind of to the side of it. I have a sifting device made out of two by four, something about maybe like two feet by one feet, covered with green, and a shovel. That's about all you really need. Right in the rocks right here. That is, that's got some oyster parts right there. That's cool. All right, let's try again. See what we, see what we can find. Hold on a minute, let me see if I can get Oh, there's the bottom part of one right there. That is an upper tooth of Scapinorhynchus. It doesn't have the roots associated with it, but there we go. The warm, shallow ocean provided an easy habitat for algae to grow and then things that live off of algae, small critters, and then larger and larger critters. In shallow oceans, that's where you get lots of life. Out in the middle of the sea, where it's one mile deep, deep, ocean that's one mile deep is like a desert wasteland. But shallow ocean is like a tropical rainforest. And so that richness is what gives us the opportunity to discover all these treasures in Northeast Mississippi. That are Nope, you gotta keep on going. Wait, wait, wait a minute, whoa, nice. You need to check this out. Look at that. You can even see some of the accessory denticles. Look at that, that, that that's not a bad, that's not a bad tooth. That's pretty nice. And so whenever it comes to the fossilization process, soft body parts really don't preserve very well. And so the hard, hard body parts like teeth do preserve well. That's what makes these significant. Bam! Whoa! That is, oh my goodness, that has a sharp enough cusp on it to cut a person, so be careful. One of the better upper teeth I have ever found. 75 million year old Cretaceous Scapanorhynchus upper tooth. Talking about a nine or a 10 footer, possibly. 
So it's kind of neat to be able to participate in, 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 in this cycle and to be able to learn from the past. And that's what fossils help us to do. And we were digging in a stream bed. It's kind of hard to believe, but we were digging to sift to try to find shark teeth. If you look at the edge right here, you can kind of see a transparent edge right here. This one has not tumbled through the stream. This has been pretty well protected. It hasn't been worn out. This was the first upper tooth we found the other day, and then this was the second one. So notice the difference. The beauty is that it's free. That is the beauty. Anybody can come here, you can dig in the, in the dirt, and with a screen, something like a screen door, you can find fossils. Archaeology tells us that the people who built these mounds here at Winterville had a similar civilization to the Natchez Indians, in that they both created a social hierarchy that left enough free time, after providing for the basics of life, like food and shelter, to take on these gargantuan civic projects of building mounds. You know, it's amazing the things you can find out about people who lived a long time ago just by what they left behind. But sometimes what we see it's not what it appears to be. When people in the community find out that I work at the Old Capitol Museum, the first question they ask is, where's the mummy and when can I see her? Everybody still loves that mummy. It is the most asked about artifact in the state of Mississippi. The mummy was donated to the Department of Archives and History in 1923. It came in with a larger collection of Native American artifacts, and it was on display in the new capital for many years. It was believed that the mummy was an Egyptian mummy, and it was a girl right at the age of puberty. For many years, that's the story that was told to every school child that walked by the mummy in the new capital. When this building was the State History Museum, the decision was made not to display this alleged Egyptian mummy because she had no connection to Mississippi history. And when the Old Capitol Museum of Mississippi History opened in 1961, the mummy was not on display. That decision was unpopular, <laughs> but she remained in storage. And many Mississippians were very angry about the fact that their mummy was not on display. In 1969, a student at the University of Mississippi Medical Center x-rayed the mummy. And it turned out she was not a mummy at all. She was a fake. Made of paper mache and stuffed with nails and newspapers. I think a lot of people in Mississippi were probably very shocked and disappointed that their favorite artifact really wasn't an Egyptian princess mummy after all. So it stayed in our warehouse for a while, and then in 2008, we decided that it was significant enough as an artifact of itself that we made it an actual artifact within our collection. In 2009, after the building reopened, after the restoration following Katrina, you know, what better way to celebrate than bringing back one of the museum's most famous visitors? You know, we have a lot of famous visitors, but she's probably the most famous of all. Every year, in anticipation of displaying the mummy in October, we retrieve her from collection storage at the two Mississippi museums and make the journey to the Old Capitol Museum. It is a little awkward. She is oddly shaped, so that creates a few challenges. And moving a object in a coffin always prompts a response from passerbys. The mummy's on display every October. It's a good way to welcome fall, the state fair, and kind of get everyone in the mood for Halloween. I didn't know what to think. A uh, mummy in Mississippi kind of surprised me at first. Um, it is pretty cool to see something like that. Uh, it is a little creepy, but it's pretty cool overall. I was very surprised to see one in Mississippi especially, and I was a little creeped out. I was like, those are here? I only thought they were in Egypt. 
I did not expect that to be here, of all places. I expected it to be you know, in, like an Egyptian museum. It was really interesting, and I think that it's amazing that we got the opportunity to come and see it. I think maybe the mystery of it all is the appeal of the mummy, how it came to us, why we believed for so long that it was a real Egyptian mummy, and then the shocking way that it was discovered that it was not a mummy. This is still one of the most popular things we display. I think that it is a fake, adds to the story. <laughs> People love coming to see the dummy mummy. That's about all the time we have for our visit to the wonderful mounds in Greenville. If you'd like information about anything you've seen, contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads. And make sure you like our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. And check out our Mississippi Roads Facebook page, too. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.